Hello, I am Chris McIntosh and I am the managing partner of Glenorchy Capital, as well as the founder and chief editor of Capitalist Exploits Insider Research Service. What I'm going to do today is walk you through one of the key trends that we've been identifying within Glenorchy and managing um, clients' capital based on some of these aspects. I'm going to walk you through this major trend that I think has significant implications around um, what is taking place in the markets and how that can affect us. It is unfortunately quite an, uh, a sort of disturbing trend, if you will, but I don't get to make the rules. So let's get into it. To begin with, we believe that inflation is arguably the greatest financial risk that one can face. And it isn't until inflation becomes widely evident that any steps are likely to be taken to combat it. Furthermore, the situation that we find ourselves in with respect to central banks and governments indebtedness means that there really is unlikely to be any significant steps taken to combat it. And so the asymmetry that exists for us to ensure that firstly, we protect ourselves and secondly, we can profit from this setup is more important than it's ever been before. Now, what I want to first go and take a look at is how this risk has built, how, why we've gotten to this point, and then we can address how that can be uh, looked at from an investment perspective. Here, I'm showing you the Russell versus, sorry, the Russell growth versus value index. And as you can see, this is at historical lows for value and historical highs for growth. Looked at a slightly different way, what we can see here is this absolutely extraordinary setup where we have the greatest <laughs> bubble um, in growth that we've ever seen, quite frankly. Now, it's not unusual for trailing valuations to soar after any sort of major market bottom, which is certainly what we had back in March of this year. Asset prices, for example, typically increase usually as an in or an, in anticipation of some sort of recovery in profits. However, what we've had with the post-March rally really took place a absolutely catastrophic plunge in earnings per share expectations. Um, and so as a result, the Russell 2000 index now trades at really completely unthinkable um, values over 87 times earnings as, as we speak. Now, to understand what, how we got to the situation, I want to talk about globalization. I think it is key to understanding where we're at today. Globalization has been something that we've experienced really uh, pretty much since Bretton Woods. And, um, you know, this experience that we've had with globalization has been extraordinarily disinflationary. Now, the world's been through many globalization periods in the past, um, beginning with the age of discovery, for example, in the 15th to 18th centuries. Um, and all of these globalization periods have been interspersed with periods where we've had sudden, sometimes shocking reversals in and oftentimes wars that have uh, accompanied, accompanied these reversals. The last expansion we have been talking about uh, and said was coming to an end in 2016 because the signs were all there for anybody who cared to look. Increased inequality, rising nationalism, increased geopolitical tensions, completely unsustainable debt levels and rising socialism and this these these calls for a redistribution of wealth and those are all among many of the things that we've been pointing out over the last few years what's important to understand with respect to this globalization is that international trade now drives over 46 percent of what is a 86 roughly trillion dollar economy Percentage-wise, international trade comprises almost half of global economic activity. This is much, much more than it's ever been in the past. It's difficult to understate how massive a force this globalization has had on the global economy, on global prosperity, and on certain asset classes. If we just took this component of labor, what we've had with globalization uh, was clearly going to be disinflation. We roughly 4 billion people got added to this global workforce and these 4 billion people 
were prepared to work for significantly lower wages than those in the developed world. That was always going to be deflationary. And we can see this, we look at this particular chart here. Certainly since the fall of the Berlin Wall, we've been through this extraordinary period of increased globalization. It's resulted in more and more free trade agreements. We've seen this with respect to things like the signing of NAFTA, the creation of the European Union, China entering the global trade partnerships. Um, and this globalization has been the driver behind also the offshoring of many developed nation manufacturing jobs, American jobs, European jobs. And in turn, it's also driven down the cost of consumer goods. Now, for those people who say, oh, well, this is, you know, we've just had this extraordinary period of, of deflation. What I want to point out is that we've had a lot of deflation in a lot of sectors, but it has not happened everywhere. So if we look here at the various sectors that have experienced deflation and then those that have experienced inflation, you can see quite clearly that where it was possible to actually outsource this giant labor pool, you had this extraordinary sort of deflationary environment. So, you, you know, cars, cell phones, all, you know, the shit that we buy that we fill our houses with has gone down in price. At the same time, the things that we couldn't outsource I've certainly experienced a huge amount of inflation, healthcare, um, college tuition, food, housing, um, you know, all of these things have experienced inflation. So it's important to understand why those dynamics exist. And globalization really is the main answer to this particular conundrum. Now, the other aspect that's important to understand here is how this has affected trade balances. The West has largely gone negative exporting less than it imports. Naturally, this has caused job losses, which has also fueled a sort of inequality within the developed world and developed markets, which itself has accelerated these calls for socialism, for Marxism. What's interesting is that while that's been taking place in the sort of developing world, what we've actually experienced is a broadening and increasing middle class very, very different experience to that which the developed world has, has experienced. So, you know, those taking advantage of the trends that we've seen here, certainly if you think about Silicon Valley, they've added extraordinary wealth, which has driven, out, driven up, you know, larger inequality. And that in itself is also why we've seen rising nationalism where people are going the hell with this my life's not any better sure i can get a nice cell phone for cheaper but that's not really helping me you know i'm, I'm experiencing more difficulties to paying the rent i can't send my children to college i'm not going to be able to afford it and so these are all problems that have been experienced that are that are rising and they are all reversing and that's very important for us to understand with respect to our portfolios going forward. Globalization was all about expanding the pie. Deglobalization will be about dividing an ever shrinking pie. Now, globalization, we must remember, saw the rise of many institutions, educations being education and universities being one of them. But we've seen the IMF, the United Nations, the World Health Organization, the World Trade Organization, G the G7. It's all these things. And then at a sort of community-based level, it's been local police forces, it's been community centers, state governments, things of that nature. Those are all, look around you, they're all coming under pressure. And I think at this point in time, uh, it's important to have a look at what good old Lenin said. As much as we should and do hate this man, and what he stood for, he was quite correct when he said that there are decades where nothing happens and then there are weeks where decades happen. So as this trend reverses and fast because it's happening at warp speed, mentally it's a retrenchment, it's a pulling back. Again, like I said, it's a who gets the share of the pie now and how do we, it's, it's not about expanding the pie any longer. This brings very, very different economic policies with it. It is a siren call for socialism. 
and we're still Marxist ideology, which is what we're seeing taking place. And I've written about this for anybody who's uh, read my reports on it. Um, you'll you'll get you'll get where we're coming from. And for those who haven't, you can go and download the report on what happens next, which is which is goes into a deeper detail around the Marxist uh, policies that are being pushed forward. Now, what happens in this stage is that everything really becomes binary. This is akin to the 17th century where they burnt witches. No matter how illogical it was, it will happen. It is highly probable. In fact, it is already taking place. Now, the world has been slowly trending away from this globalization towards a more protectionist, nationalistic approach. You've seen these examples with uh, renegotiations of NAFTA, Brexit, the trade wars between the United States and China, and of course, the election of some of these uh, leaders. The Trump election was a, a, a hallmark of that uncertainty and that realization that the existing status quo was not working for many people. Um, this also, I mentioned nationalism. This is really a time of wars. It's a natural consequence of deglobalization this rising nationalism, this geopolitical uncertainty. And I dare I say it, it's all been brought about financial mismanagement, um, which has caused excessive debts um, and these socialist liabilities that governments simply cannot um, fulfill. So here I'm showing you, you know, many, many walls that have gone up. In fact, since September the 11th, barriers around the world have gone from 15 to over 64 globally. Um, so again, this has been taking place before coronavirus, you know, ramped up. But that, I tell you what, is the biggest Berlin Wall that we've ever experienced. We literally have this global Berlin Wall at the moment. You uh, yeah, jump on the web and see where it is that you can fly around the world today you'll find that, you know, there is this, literally this global uh, war. So the consequences of this lockdown are also extraordinarily uh, deglobalizing the, the world. They are accelerating these trends. Um, airports are shut down, countries are shut off. In fact, even businesses within their own domestic economies are being shut. It is extraordinary, it's disturbing, but it's happening and we have to deal with it in some shape or form. Now, naturally this also impacts significantly supply chains. Those have all been broken and in many instances, uh, the damage is permanent. This is gonna result in much higher cost of goods as the scale of economies is deeply impacted. This naturally acts in a positive feedback loop with rising geopolitical tensions, more trade barriers, increasing tariffs, and ever greater calls for dividing this shrinking pie. Now, what has it done to people on the ground? Well, have a look, he has Australian unemployment, sorry, Australian employment, which has collapsed. In other words, unemployment has gone through the roof. Here is Spanish unemployment gone through the roof. Here we have our Canadian friends, not any different, the United States. Same thing, same trend. I could keep going on and show you a whole lot of different charts, but you get the point. Question is, how is this being quote unquote solved? And here is the answer. Completely unsustainable, ridiculous, manic borrowing by our financial elites. To consider that, you know, how bad this is, Assets of the balance sheets of the four major central banks now exceed, in all instances, 100% of GDP. They are completely unpayable. And for context, you know, the, again, this has been accelerated by the lockdowns as a consequence of, uh, you know, the, the pandemic, as they're calling it. If we go back to the 1918, 19 19 period with the Spanish flu, there was no economy was shut down. Um, and, you know, what followed it was the roaring 20s. I guarantee you this will not be that. We're not going to come out into any roaring 20s. 
Why? Because when you abuse the cost of capital, you abuse the capitalist system. And that is exactly what governments have done in order to fuel more debt and to also ensure that they don't have that uh, debt overwhelm them. They can't simply cannot have interest rates rising on these unsustainable debt levels. So they, it's not going to happen. Unfortunately, things like pensions can't be funded at these rates. Um, pensions are unfortunately going to go away. That's just the reality. Um, what we're seeing now is that, you know, the, this, this key root to the problem um, of central banks coming in and trying to fix this system by manipulating down the cost of capital to zero, and in some instances below zero, you must understand that that is the primary driver of capital allocation in the world in a free market system. And I'm fully aware that we've not had a free market system. We've had a quasi free market system for some time. Um, but by falsifying these interest rates, you're destroying literally every aspect of communist down the line. That's what's happening. And that in itself leads to a significantly huge problem, which we've not experienced in our lifetimes. And it is one of stagflation. It is a stagnant, shitty economy with high unemployment and rising prices. I really wish it wasn't you know, that, that case, but that's, that's what we're looking at. And what it also brings is rising inequality. Now, the pressures of inequality that we promised would come through, quite frankly, have uh, you know, blown our expectations. This was before the coronavirus came along. We've been discussing this. So again, these are just this is an acceleration of these trends that, uh, that we saw unfolding with globalization, pivoting and turning towards a deglobalization phase. Going forward, you've got to understand that the next generation, certainly in the Western world, is going to be unable to accumulate capital. This inability to accumulate capital is typically, quote unquote, solved by destroying the very system that exists. Capitalism is going to be blamed and torn down for the issues that we have today. It's has already begun down this path pre-virus and now it's accelerating. If you think about it, why would you love capitalism if you can't accumulate capital? That's the situation, folks, that we find ourselves in. So the next step that we're going to go through is economic stagnation, rising protectionism, social unrest, and the democratic capitalist ideals that we've experienced for our lifetimes being increasingly replaced by ideological Marxist ideals. We don't believe this is going to take place globally everywhere. The world is bifurcating. And that's extraordinarily important for us, not just in terms of the sectors that we invest in, but also, importantly, the geographies. So this is where our portfolio really lands up being like a chaos portfolio. And it is, at its very bones, a deep value portfolio. We believe its time is now. The sectors that we're invested in, I'm not going to make any bones about it. These, these are them. You will also notice that many of these are the very sectors that the woke crowd believe you should not be invested in. We, we believe that just creates a greater asymmetry for us. These are also sectors which are absolutely critical to human civilization. They are things, if you notice, that will not go away. A tech company can go away. The uh, natural gas is still going to be utilized. Fertilizer is still going to be utilized. Um, and so these are very, very deep value situations that we're invested in. Um, and that's, that's where we're at today. This extraordinary you know, globalization that we've had has brought us to this point. It is reversing and is now reversing at speed. Um, and this is one of our key focuses that we have on uh, where we're managing client money at Glenorchy. And this here is just, uh, you know, some wonderful pictures of myself and my co-founder of Glenorchy, Brad McFadden. Clearly, none of us are going to be entering any male beauty pageants anytime soon, but clients don't pay us for our stunning looks. And um, certainly, we've spent decades in the financial markets, and I assure you, 
we are completely dedicated to our work. This is our life. We may be wrong, but that's how we see it. Hopefully, this has been informative for you. And I will leave you with this quote because I think it is, it is quite apt. The pessimist complains about the wind. The optimist expects it to change and the realist adjusts the sails. Thank you very much for your time. Take care.